What's going on, everyone? Uh, I'm here with Cameron, and we are going to talk about uh, kind of the, the first phase of a tech career and whatever else grows out of that. I don't want to constrain this too much. Um, Cameron, why don't you just introduce yourself quickly and tell us who you are, how you got into tech, what your, where your interests are, kind of what you're doing, uh, your entire biography in one minute or less. Yeah. All right, um, let me see how fast I can talk. So yeah, my name is Cameron Stevenson. Um, I'm currently living in uh, Northern Germany. I'm originally from Nebraska. Um, yeah, so kind of how I got to, into tech, what my interests are. Um, honestly, I took a very long time to get into tech. I always knew that I liked playing with computers in some respect, but looking back now, it was really just me knowing how to navigate a menu or somebody asked me for help on something and I kind of had the pieces together to figure it out. But like if I was a kid and a drive was failing, I wouldn't be like, oh, you might have you know a bad sector on your block device. So those things wouldn't come into my head. So that was it's pretty frightening far. to from a child, to be fair. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. So, you know, I was I was busy playing Pokemon and doing other things rather than, uh, oh, yeah. you know, too too much on the computer um and yeah in high school i kind of did a lot of like software related stuff we were building like websites and stuff like that but my high school was very uh small it was a small town there was only like 25 th or like 30 no there was 45 kids in my graduating class so it was you know, quite small there wasn't much going on um so it wasn't like we had this broad range of cool new tech we could play with it was just um, some basic stuff and then uh, college, I studied management information systems. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I didn't want to do full-blown development. Um, that was kind of obvious to me. And then I moved around a bit. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I found myself kind of studying abroad and moving away from tech. Was, honestly, I didn't think I was actually going to keep doing it. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. <clears throat> I, was just, I was just curious, at this point, it's kind of like college and the years after when you're like, ah, I'm not sure what I want to do. And I don't know that this, this tech stuff is for me. What, this is a really hard question maybe to answer, but what did kind of your mental map of the tech world look like? Was it, was it, I'm, I'm guessing the resolution was quite low. It was probably, uh, for example, when I, when I was that age, I was like, well, there's like programming and I think I need to know a lot of math for that. And then there's, uh, there's this whole, I was interested in computer security and I was like, well, there's like this very young pen testing thing, but these, these guys are so good. There's no way I could even like apply to that. And then I, I remember there was this kind of like, kind of all the other boring computer stuff. Uh, like I knew that IT guys also fixed like coffee makers. And I was like, I don't know that that's for me. What did that kind of look like in your mind, the, the, your options at that point in the tech world? Yeah, it was very similar. It was really just, you know, development. Um, Maybe I had some sort of idea of system administration, but I don't, you know, it was, I don't really think so. I think that was still something that was already too specific that I wouldn't have known kind of existed. Um, I really thought people were just developers and there was kind of like business managers that influenced where things went. Um, this later in college, I did, we did start doing some like, like larger projects of, almost like Greenfield, like you start from the basics, you have this project of some sort and it was more, it was always intertwined with business, uh, the business view of things, not really a system view from, yeah, from that perspective. Now, how I know things now, um, <clears throat> at least. So it was, I would say it was similar. Like I knew Kali Linux existed and I was like, whoa. Right. Whoa, that was never gonna be something I knew how it worked. And now looking back, I'm like, geez, just, start you know play with it you'll yes, get there exactly. someday pick a tool yeah <clears throat> yeah so i um i studied in norway i liked it that's where i met my now wife um, and why i'm in germany um and then i was like i'm not i'm just trying to do other stuff so then i went we had a scholarship that go to china so i went to china I was like yeah this is this is what i'm doing not growing up i'm just gonna keep throwing around this idea of how I can just live somewhere else and do something that sounds fun. I was kind of chasing a dream that wasn't ever going to really become anything. Oh yeah. Um, I know that feeling. 
At least you did cool. Like, I was like a night security guard and a and a landscaper <laughs> before I got into tech. It was... yeah, there was at least um, I worked for my father. He does um, like underground construction. We buried cable lines, coaxial cable, in the backyards from the pedestal to the house. Um, now he does directional drilling, so he does a lot of infrastructure work for um, telecommunications. So I at least understood how all that was supposed to work at a basic view, um, but still everything years, behind it is one experience to your resume right there. That's not where yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so behind that, I was always like really confused. Everything just seemed too complex to grasp and to understand. I mean, to be honest, it's not too much different now. I just kind of know what pieces to poke to get the information I need. Um, and yeah, so when I was in China, I always liked Linux. Um, I liked open source or free software, uh, I guess more appropriately. And I thought that this was cool. Like this is a cool thing to play with. Um, I thought it was interesting, but I was always afraid of failure and I never wanted to actually try it and get into it. And so when I was in China, I put Ubuntu back on my laptop. I had time. So I was like, okay, let me just play with this. And then next thing I know, it's 2016. So not too long. Um, I'm in Germany and I buy, uh, I figure out that I like this. This is fun. I'm just playing around the command line. I'm figuring out, I'm understanding how my system is working basically. Yeah. And then I buy a book and that's when I, I, I knew I wanted to do something with Linux. So I needed to figure out how I'm supposed to interview for Linux, um, what things I'm supposed to know. And that is when I actually first found your videos was I was searching specifically for the interview process. Interesting. <clears throat> and, yeah. and then I stumbled on the more Linuxy aspects of it as well. Yeah, that, make, that totally makes sense. It's so interesting to hear that because that mirrors exactly how I got into it. It's, and I think this is true for a lot of people that uh, they put that interview cart before the, like I run Linux on my laptop course. Uh, where until uh, someone just left a comment actually on, on one of these, like, you know, I, I made a few interview videos and they consistently are just like the biggest draws for viewers because that is just what people are searching for. And someone commented, I, you know, I watched this video a year ago and I was like, this seems complicated and hard. It's like, I'm going to have trouble memorizing all this stuff for the interviews. And then uh, this person was basically like, I, I just came back a year later after just using Linux normally. And now I realize these are simple questions and like, I had to go use Linux so that I'm not just memorizing rote, you know, answers to questions. Yeah. Um, and it's it's exactly that. Like I did the, the exact same thing. It's like I was interested in um, like actually networking and security. That was the first thing. I had an uncle who worked for Lucent, which was then bought by Cisco, and he gave me his old Lucent TCP IP networking stack manuals. It was like binders filled with printed pages. And I tried. I was like, this is cool. I'm smart. I can memorize this. Like this makes, I need to, he told me I need to learn this to be a hacker. So I'm going to learn this. I'm like 15 at the time. And, uh, you know, obviously I got nowhere. Like I, I could barely, he, he ended up quizzing me on, on some TCP IP stuff. He's like, you know, is, is UDP a, uh, reliable protocol and is TCP a secure protocol? You know, it's like everything I got wrong. And, it was, it was exactly that. It's that attempt to like just learn information as opposed to use a thing for a purpose um, that that was just a kind of a waste of time. So that's what I always tell people is like exactly what you did, you know, like install Ubuntu on your thing. Even if you don't like use it for anything except for pirating movies and like, like I don't know, browsing the internet, just, just start using it and then open the terminal, like make a terminal shortcut and then use that for some stuff and just play around. And then as you run into problems, try to solve them through the terminal, you know, and before you know it, you're, you're, you're pretty good at basic Linux stuff. And yeah, then the next thing that I did that really got me to the, that got me my first job was I was just thirsty for more Linux and yeah. know, tech stuff to learn. And I was looking at job ads and six months after, you know, picking a thing out of a requirement for a job and learning that and then doing another one, I was like, wait, for, for this one, I know everything. Like I, and then I just clicked apply and that's how it happened. So uh, I love that. I love that approach. I just, sorry, I just wanted to jump in and like highlight that practical approach because I feel like that is, that's my job on the internet to scream. I'm the guy screaming about practically using things to learn them. Yeah, that's, 
it, it gives you a, 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 an ability to be self-sufficient um, and self-motivating as well, because there was, I always needed a place to start. I needed somebody to tell me where to start, but I didn't know what to do. So it took me to start that and just kick that process off and then realize, okay, the, the internet exists. What am I doing? I don't, I just figure it out and start. It's, it's still, a, it's a constant battle still. If there's something I want to learn, I'm afraid to start. I'm afraid of failing. I don't want to, I've got two kids now. So I got to like really section out my time. Um, you know, I get burnt out, I get exhausted. So it's just a balancing act of all these things, but it's, it's doable, it's manageable. Um, so just kind of getting started and, and using it. And that was the big thing with um, Linux as an operating system. I just needed to use it. And now it's all I use. I don't, I make my wife use Linux. <laughs> well done. You should start a dating and relationship advice channel. <laughs> How I got my wife on Linux. That's a good one. <laughs> Need like a yeah, she would. She's still upset at times with it, but she just said, it's a typical end user story. You, you have to change your workflow a little bit. It's not difficult. Okay. Change, be open to change and you'll figure it out. Like the, the way you're doing it's not the best way to do it. Somebody's got a okay. better way and there's other tools that work. And so now she she's fine with it. I got to manage it and deal with it, but I don't care to touch Windows machines anymore. I just don't want to. So. My Windows machine does two things. It records Linux videos on a VM and plays Battlefield. <laughs> That's about it. That's what I, I would love to, I, I still game on a Windows machine. It's the one Windows box, but it's my Windows box, okay? I'm not in charge yeah, of other exactly. people's. Oh, Her parents, they live down the street from me and I got them, they're running Ubuntu because they just need to browse the web. Awesome. What do you, yeah, I did and the I same. think she runs Fedora. I use her as my distro hopper. So I had her on Ubuntu and I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, Fedora, I need to try this. But, you know, that's a I'm not going to use it because I don't I don't use Fedora. Yeah. I, of course, use Arc. Um, so, you know, I, I I figured out what I use and how I use it. Yeah. And so I was like, OK, you tell me a little bit. Let me see how this works. That's great. Yeah, I have, I think for the last seven or eight years, my mom's been on Linux Mint and she literally, I, I she had some problem with something. And her computer was dying. She's like, well, maybe I'll get a new one. And I, you know, every time I give her the opportunity, like, if you want, I grew up with, with Macs in the house. So I was like, I will get you another Mac. You know, you kind of, you kind of remember how to use those. And she's like, no, 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 I like my Linux. You know, it's like, oh my God, I like record this shit and put it on my channel or something. It's like, yeah. Once I like people, my Linux. Once people have a way, they, they just like, they're fine with it. You know, like you said, once they're, once they're open to just changing their little workflow for something, it's fine. Mm. Yeah, so, um, you know, that kind of got me started. And I, after that point, I've been lucky. <laughs> there, it's, I've been extremely lucky. They, so the smaller town I'm in um, had a small web hosting company. And they were, I was back in the States uh, after we got married. And I applied for the job, but I wasn't going to be back home or back to Germany for well over a month. Well, good thing in Germany, everybody needs, if I quit my job right now, I'm committed for three months at the place. I don't get to leave. Yeah. And so you have this very slow turnover um, for getting new jobs and stuff. So to them, it wasn't a big deal. I was like, oh, shit, I'm not going to get this because I'm going to take too long. It's not because I'm not going to be able to have the interview. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to be there in time. Um, and it was, a, it was a web hosting company. All of the infrastructure was limited everything was Linux and um, come to find out that it's two younger people, the mother companies based in Sweden. And they've basically said, yeah, don't do anything new. You keep running it, how it's running, we're gonna ingest it. There's a short lifespan. In the next couple of years, this job is most likely not gonna exist. So like, okay, that's fine. I didn't, wasn't necessarily told that right away. I just kind of figured that out a little bit later, but they'd been saying that for years and they hadn't committed to doing anything. So uh, everything was Linux. Everything was the whole web hosting, like the shared web hosting platform was all built in like PHP. It was custom made. All the old engineers were gone. It was just a couple of us monkeys banging away on a keyboard trying to make sure things didn't fail like absolutely that's no i know like everyone objectively 
it's not a good situation legacy spaghetti php running like and and everything depends on it but i have to say especially i feel like when you're earlier in your career it is a tremendously fun thing because there's there's very little pressure on you to like just be productive like within a week yeah and there's, so there's a lot of this like oh yeah just we all just kind of go and explore this stuff so <laughs> you have this kind of license to just like learn find out some stuff and and you know maybe you'll learn something that even the more the more senior folks like don't even know about the thing you're working on like did you know it does this yeah. horrific thing in this one file over here um yeah there, but there were no senior folks it was just the three of us there were I didn't have a manager everybody like it was everybody got paid the same did the same job had the same requirements that was just it we just existed in this void of don't f it up uh, and was so anything that surprised you when you got to this like first like tech gig like what was that that like all of it the whole thing was surprising like how how complex the system was i still don't remember what all the things did and where they were um there was like some weird machines that had a set of scripts that ran and there was this weird nagios thing that somehow was pushing notifications but i don't know how it was interconnected um it was this self-baked red hat i think centos derivative using like a 2.6 kernel that it was just all just what I don't, I, I don't even now with all the stuff I know, I would still just be like spaghetti string pulling a knot. I don't know if you fish, but if you fish and you get a knot, you're just like pulling one line at a time. Like, I don't, eventually it's going to come undone. It just got more spread out. Yeah. It never, it never solved itself um, yeah. <clears throat> by the time I left. Um, and the um, big pusher of me going away was I, you've mentioned this in your video is the hell of data centers and I live uh, so the data centers in a bigger city I'm trying to be non descriptive but <laughs> I've already like given everything away. <laughs> uh, the, the, the data center was an hour and 45 two hours away and things broke all the time so when i was on call i had this just stress of yeah. oh shit this is gonna break i get more money but i hated that stress yeah. i i'm okay with getting up and solving something in the middle of the night software wise but hardware because it was always we had a cage of just old like pentium duo something processors these were all desktop hardware in a cage with these individual storage servers all in desktop cases and oh, that, the classic CD. early 2000s mess oh. like the <laughs> amazing and power supplies would burn up all the time and, and you know and i'm we're just going there i'm driving two hours at two o'clock in the morning to replace a power supply and then i'm coming home yeah and i'm hating my life while it's it's a it's a <laughs> work day in the middle of the night yeah um, yeah, that it's, it's funny because like, <laughs> just tell my wife, like I've been on call for over 10 years, essentially straight now. And, and I, um, I'm actually about to switch, I'm staying at HashiCorp and I'm, I'm kind of switching job roles. And I just sort of realized out of the blue, this is the first time I'm not going to be on call basically in my adult life. Like it's going to be weird. I'm going to like take a backpack to the movies you know once a month or <laughs> like you know it's uh yeah it's crazy i um i really lucked out with this thing it was something i, I kind of always wanted to do always wanted to do at hashi work too and um but yeah I, I like didn't even think about it how how long i've been on call and, it, and it's because the when someone says oh you know during an interview are you willing to be to go on call for this role it's like yeah in principle i am but you know i've had on call experiences that ranging all the way from like nightmare every week i am up at two in the morning for hours um to like, like right now uh you know we're responsible for for terraform cloud being up um and we anyway, inherited a big legacy infrastructure improved as much as we could before we kind of broadly released this and since then we've been kind of tuning making smaller architectural changes trying to get reliability uh to somewhere we, we feel is a, you know good and I get, I don't think I have been paged in six months in, in off hours. Ooh. It's like every once in a while on a, on a Friday, like an overzealous 
developer <laughs> will like push something that breaks something for five minutes, um, you know, because it should be feature flag, but it isn't, you know, whatever. It's not like a totally understandable, forgivable thing. And it's just, I just like sleep to the point where I'm actually like forgetting to take my computer to the grocery store when I'm for the week that I'm mm. on call, you know, it's like, yeah. So I think kids, if you're watching this and someone asks you in an interview, <laughs> are you willing to go on call? You know, you can say, yeah, you know, I totally am in principle, blah, blah, blah. You can talk about some of your previous on-call experiences if you have them and then be sure to grill the shit out of every other employee that you talk to that's going to be on your team about, yeah how often they go on call, how big the on-call rotation is, like how many, between how many people it's split, uh, how many pages they have gotten during you know, work hours and off work hours over the last three months. And you know, if, if, if they're not like scratching their heads and being like, I think it's like two or something, you know, if it's like, uh, you mean this week, uh, you know, <laughs> because you're signing up for, for what might be a shit day. just saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, you really do. I mean, when you're in the interview, I was just, I got this humble bundle a long time ago and uh, it had this book, Seeking SRE. And I've been reading it because we can get about this later, but I think that's the route that I want to go. And it was um, talking about the interview process and, you know, it's reminding you that you're, you know, you're the candidate, you get to drive a lot of the things you shouldn't necessarily be too afraid to push back and, uh, you shouldn't take opportunities that you think are opportunities, but there's a bunch of red flags to them. And being on call is a part of it. If, if something's not working right, if you're consistently being called in the middle of the night and things like there's something about that system that's not architected, that's not engineered, or there's something about the people, the processes, something is off. Yep. Um, so that's a, that's a great, yeah, that's a great Thing to point out is like on call getting getting paged is not it's never just a technical issue if it's if it's more than once in a blue moon it's like it is an organizational issue if it's more if it's annoying at all basically uh yeah yeah um are you talking about the kind of sre um ideas around like toil and and that type of stuff and like noise or were you thinking kind of in a different direction like that you want to go into I don't know yet. I've begun figuring out what it is. And at the base level, it started to sound interesting because this gets more into my current position now. So I'm a systems engineer, but you know, everybody loves to have engineer at their, on their title. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm always an engineer. Um, I think engineering is more of a philosophy and approach than, you know, a function that you perform seven times a day. It's like, it's, that's, yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it, DevOps is supposed to be the same way, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, that doesn't stop there. anyone from having DevOps engineers. <laughs> I remember trying to fight that fight about ten years ago. Didn't get far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, now my current job, we develop software for the shipping industry, and uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm a ch- in charge. I'm an operations kind of engineer on the test side of things. So I'm not responsible for anything production wise. So we, we work with the developers, the DevOps people, the supporters, the professional services, all, all things in the test realm, but there is production stuff in there, the support people and all that. But um, that's the thing is that there's this weird balance of there's, we own a lot of software solutions spread across a bunch of different countries. And so there's like DevOps teams in different places that have different roles. I think ideas and philosophies like DevOps and even SRE, which is an even more kind of corporate sponsored and branded idea about how to, how to implement DevOps. Um, not saying there's nothing there. Like my title right now is SRE. <laughs> like I, I buy into the philosophy. It's just, I think, I think, everyone has exactly the kind of story and tone of voice when they're describing it that you do right now, which is like, yeah, like we're trying, we know about DevOps. It's just hard organizationally to do that. Um, It's just Mm -hmm. something there's just always like gears seemingly grinding between, you know, business priorities and how you end up actually like, how many people do you have? Do you have 200 people to split between, you know, ops and product and development like roles like because if you do yeah you can top down mandate a devops thing and like structure the teams that way but if you're a normal company like most companies out there it's like you probably have you know 15 people that are engineers with like 
vastly different skill sets in different areas, you're going to have to, you know, and, and maybe it just doesn't make sense to have one huge pool of people working on everything, DevOpsing together beautifully and having mega fucking standups every morning that take half an hour because there's so many people in your team. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of great, amazing things about that philosophy, but I think one of the, of course, a business would try to kind of like proceduralize the philosophy, right? Like the rubber has to meet the road. We have to, what does this mean? Does this mean daily standups? Yes. Well, it's not technically in the DevOps like principles. It's just about communication, you know? So it's like, yeah, you know, I think all philosophies sound great until you have to implement them. <laughs> and then re regardless of which one it is, it's like, there is just this kind of friction where real world engineering meets these lofty ideas about like, yeah. I mean, SRE is the same way. It's like noise yep. and toil are bad and we should have error budgets for everything. But it's like, if management says someone has to implement a service in a given time frame, guess what goes to the end of the line? It's instrumentation, monitoring, alerting. It's like, it's just yeah. is how it is. Like, yeah, when you're yeah. Younger, when you have an extra $20 billion to burn, maybe there's a way around that. But, but yeah, yeah mere mortals, I don't, I don't see it. You know, just you do the best you can is my point. And I think yeah. people judging themselves too harshly against these, these kind of, I already used the word lofty, but I'll, I'll just, I'll say these lofty ideals is, it's just a, you're never going to measure up. Like I've never seen a place fully measure up perfectly. It doesn't mean it's, you're doing the wrong thing, you know? Anyway, so yeah. you didn't ask for that. No. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes sense. That's, you know, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk was I yeah. figured there was things that I could gain from this as well, because um, I'm in that stage now. So I'm in this IT space and I, you know, I'm trying to automate everything that I touch. I hate this monkey see monkey do work. Um, if I get a project, I at least I was using maybe the wrong set of tooling back then. Now I'm trying to change that, but I would do everything in Ansible. I would get it so it had a way to replicate it. So I've been deep into Ansible for a couple of years now of just, yeah. And I don't get micromanaged by my boss. Like I'm, you know, I, if there's a big project, it's understood that I can uh, handle it and, it can, you know, start plan and conceive and then drive it through. And then I can automate the things as I go through it and help drive those things. And I get to choose what I want to do. I had that at my last job though. And I, I'm missing being around people that know, I want to, I don't want to be the guy that's like, oh, we need something automated. Um, Cameron can figure it out. I would rather it be that we're working on that machine together. And I almost feel like an idiot because my colleagues know more things than I do. And I want to learn from them. Now that I have two kids and I'm kind of, spearheading this in my own team i don't have anybody else driving me and i don't necessarily have any people that i can rely on to impart that knowledge to um, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm missing that aspect yeah and that's why i know that I, eventually i might do what i can I, I don't have enough power to implement change in my own organization so i can't really do much in the space i'm in um, not to say that i will leave, but that's why i always leave the door open because i know that i want to move to, towards a more DevOpsy thing because I want to be with the people, the process, and use the tools that I'm trying to do now, and that it's because I believe it, um, and I believe it it will work, and it is the way that things should go. And then SRE was just kind of this offhanded. I just started really diving into what it meant, and I was like, okay, there's at least something specific because the DevOps is just supposed to be an idea. I don't want to go true. to DevOps. And then just be in charge of, I don't know, one small thing like a pipeline or just like Jira answering Jira tickets. And it's like, that's similar to what I'm doing now in IT um, that I'm trying to move away from. So, yeah, I think, I think one, I mean, and again, I am by far not an expert, you know, it's like, I'm also just like, we all have a very limited lifespan. You can only work at so many companies and get, and get those experiences necessarily color your perspective. So it's like I, someone with the exact amount of experience that I do may have completely different opinions, but I'll say one approach that I have found actually works for me is targeting companies, targeting basically company culture as your highest thing 
almost regardless mm. of I mean obviously if it doesn't say like we try to do DevOps or SRE or whatever like we're trying to work together and communicate and like you know be flexible and uh, have people of different kind of silos and skill sets work together like if that isn't coming up in the kind of the feeling you get from the company it's a problem but um, I think targeting company culture first and and um, these more like DevOpsy buzzword things second is important. Yeah, I think you're not wrong that targeting like DevOps engineer, SRE roles with that title is, is a good kind of shorthand to get to a lot of those uh, types of companies that are at least trying to do the right thing. So yeah, I think, I think you're on the right track. Um, and, and I think it's actually very useful to be where you are kind of, um, I think we talked about this over email too, like implementing uh, kind of spearheading these things is great experience to then present at that interview. Like, hey, like I really believe in these principles and I tried and here are some projects that I did to try to like reflect those principles. Um, you know, now I'm looking to like take the next step you know, work with a bigger team or a team that's further along in this process and like see where I can help there. There's a lot of good um, aspects of working where I work, but I just feel stagnant at times. Yeah. And that's that's the worst. So, you know, I, I had this idea. Um, I was running a bunch of stuff with Ansible and I was speaking with this DevOps team out of Oakland. And I was like, guys, um, you know, I've got this way that I'm taking all the templates and I'm getting everything automated and I'm, you know, performing the updates and just getting them to a certain state because a lot of our stuff isn't immutable. Somebody needs something. I would just update the template and push it out. They're going to install the version of something that they need. They're just testing, whatever. It's more about the data set they're testing against or some feature, but whether or not I have a certain patch level or whatever wasn't necessarily needed. And, um, you know, then he was like, have you tried Packer? I was like, well, I didn't know this existed. <laughs> so let me see. And then I spent the next several weeks. And of course, that led me down this hole of I got to know how the precede config file works in Debian. I have to know how the unintended file works. And then once I got done, it was kind of like, oh, now I need to automate. I have to fully automate it. Now I'm, I'm still pushing a button. I can spin up the template. I can, you know, I can then bootstrap it with Ansible and get everything installed that I want. I change the credentials around. I use my vault so I don't have to, you know, worry about secrets being shown in plain text. I got everything going that I need to do. It's like, but I'm still pressing the button. And then, so I just get back all the DevOps guy. I'm like, Jenkins, give me, give me a project. So let me, I need to figure this out. And now I'm looking into Jenkins and I'm just like, I, you know, I don't have something I need to build. I don't build software. I have some scripts, but that's what I'm going to use it for and see if it works. And then I'll have the knowledge. I think that's a great, uh, very natural path. Uh, and it sounds like it's almost, it's almost like a mentorship thing that's happening. where just like someone with more like logos and experience with different technologies in their brain can kind of help guide you to like oh yeah what you're trying to do you want to look in this direction i think that's mm -hmm. one of those classic mid-career like this is where you we realize like hey i'm not a beginner anymore like i i can independently right. learn anything you put in front of me but i don't know what the right uh what the right thing to learn is like what collection of stuff i need to learn maybe i should just make a video just like highlighting every year you know like the 2021 like list o devops tech that you probably should know one of unless you like have some alternative to one of them like then just learn that but i think just as a because it's so broad but there are you know pretty pretty consistent kind of commonalities like everyone's going to need some kind of automation server thing like jenkins or you know circle ci like some kind of ci slash automation thing like you, you need an answer for that in your in your yeah and same with like you need some kind of like scripting and automation thing and Ansible is way better than a bunch of bash scripts. Um, and, you know, if it's like, if you're running on a cloud or, or kind of doing any kind of deterministic building of, of artifacts that you're moving through a pipeline, like, oh, and then the devs run this in test and then they do it in, in prod. Um, you want something like Packer where you know, like this is going to result in a, in, in a build that passes all of these tests. And like, we know all the stuff is in there and configured right. And, then that artifact, whether it's an, you know, Amazon machine image or, or something else, um, 
you know, moves through a process. Um, yeah, there's so sorry, my point is there's there's definitely like common tools and at least principles that are answered pretty specifically by a few to different tools. Um, and it makes sense. I, I, I wonder if it's that it's that like kind of transition to needing, you know, a beginner and, and I get like emails and, and like Twitter DMs about this all the time. Oh, I'm a, I'm a total beginner. I need a mentor. Should I watch your Linux videos? And it's like, dude, you don't need a mentor. You need to just like you were saying, you need to just install Linux, start using it, figure out if you even enjoy this. Like it might turn out you hate this. Like you hate the process of Googling for like fixing something on Linux. Like it's probably not for you then because that's 90% of it. Um, and, but right at that kind of point that you're at, it, it's true. I th and I think I was always lucky that I had mentors just around like the guy that hired me originally um, for my first tech job was just around and available all the time to like help guide me when I was thinking about interviewing somewhere else, when I was thinking about which skills mm -hmm. to learn. He was like, he, he knew a lot of people doing a lot of different things in tech and was kind of able to, uh, to say like, okay, well, like networking is amazing, but if you go for a networking job that may limit you in other ways, um, as an example, and having, having that type of input, um, maybe that's, maybe that kind of directional, like broader input is, is, uh, what you're really looking for. And that's, you know, yes, you can have mentors outside of work, but I think practically people benefit much more from mentors at work so having a workplace where you have someone who is significantly more experienced than you is really useful because they can really like tailor the projects you end up getting how much help you end up getting how much you know they, they tailor everything to to kind of helping you progress and yeah just having that that at work relationship can just be incredibly useful and just make you extremely productive where it's like yeah you know how to google you know how to go learn a tool like fine but having someone save you the first 30 hours of like, what, how do I, what's the best way to do this even um, is, is incredibly yeah. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same way um, in school. I, I always had a, I always talked to my professors at university uh, and I still, I don't talk to them as much anymore. I haven't talked to them in a few years, but even when I was abroad and coming back, I would go speak with one of my old like geography, I didn't study geography. It was just, I had to take this class and he was a nice guy and we'd chat and he was curious. And um, I got a minor in philosophy and I just, I just having a good personality and working with the professor and just kind of talking, he, he's like one day asked me if I could watch his dog when he went out of town. And I was like, okay, them fostering relationships. And to me, that was always important. That was always important to have somebody to talk to that was done what I've done and passed it, especially because I took a route that nobody in my family, none of my friends, nobody went this route. So I've got to figure it out, but I don't, I don't know what I don't know. So I've just got to, you know, keep some people around me and keep things. And that's what I do with YouTube at the very least is keep um, some channels, follow some people that I think can help guide that. So that's cool. I think, I've, I've never really thought, I mean, I've tended because like, you know, the YouTube channel's like, I don't know, eight years old now or something. People have like grown with that channel and like gotten their first tech jobs mm -hmm. and their second ones. And now they're just like better than me at most tech stuff. So it's like, I, I mm -hmm. have just naturally kind of grown into more the like tech career advice thing, because I think it's also just a higher leverage thing. Um, yeah. Like you're saying early career, it's like, once you learn how to learn just you, you kind of know what the first stuff is, but then it's those, it's those thorny mid-career decisions or, or I hate saying mid-career a lot, but you know what I'm saying? Once, once you're kind of on the path already, that's the hard stuff. I, that's the stuff that makes a difference. Like negotiating an extra 15 grand on, on some contract you're going to take or whatever, like that can make a huge difference down the road or. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's um, mid-career. It is where I'm at. I mean, I've been here for, five years now. I mean, I, this isn't very long. It's been more like four. My first, you know, there's been a lot of these things that I've had to just figure out of, as I've gone around. And I, people act like some people act like I can do, or I'm very, I, I'm not an idiot, but like some of the stuff that I'm doing is magic. And just like I said earlier, I'm literally <laughs> yeah. just a monkey slamming away on my keyboard. I don't, I do so many things where it's like, I, I break things all the time, but I just make sure I can break things before I break it. And, you know, things don't always work out. And it's just, yeah, I'm at that mid level. There's a lot. I know that there's a lot to, to go. Yeah. I'll, um, 
I'll take this as a, a signal to make more of that content and hopefully get, you know, I, I have some great mentors that I think can speak to different uh, things in a, in a way that's way more kind of compact and like sort of pithy than, than, than I can. Maybe I'll try to get some of them on the channel too and just talk about kind of where things are, what, what some, what some ways to kind of like move past these, these blocks are. But yeah, I think practically speaking, I think you can recognize really good um, mentors in, a, in as long as a company has a good interview process, you can often see them right away. It's like someone you get into a, a passionate like discussion about like how email works because you know, whatever, like I, I remember I interviewed for a company once and I, uh, so, you know, he, I knew they did a lot of emailing. So I like read the chapter on email in, in the <laughs> Unix and Linux system administrators handbook yep. beforehand. And then it was just like, I was just like Johnny on the spot with like, you know, every, MTA. yes, exactly. Like the every actions. email implementation, do you like, how does DKIM work? Like, how does that lookup actually work? Like what request happens first? You know, where's the key? Like, how does it get, anyway. And I, <laughs> I would fail that interview right now if I took it again. <laughs> I was just like so ready and motivated. And that like just doing well on that, portion of the interview, we just got done way you know, in 15 minutes instead of an hour. And I spent the rest of the time just kind of like excitedly talking about actually the Hashi stack with <laughs> the guy who was interviewing me. And I was like, yeah, you know, I just like, I really want a chance to use this stuff at a company for real. This is like 2014, 2015. These, these tools are on the rougher, newer side. And um, yeah, it was just like, we just had this very excited, passionate conversation. It turned out like we were passionate about the same thing, thought like this revolution was coming in kind of the, the tooling world uh, that was just going to make our lives way easier and make it make it not crazy to, to build large infrastructure. Um, and that, you know, so I came on at that company and it was like, that was like that seeded, but I could tell right from the from the interview like oh this is someone who knows way more than me that I, like i want to know yeah. what this dude does. and having that feeling about someone you know not just like some smart ass in an interview who like asks gotcha questions and then like acts disdainful it's like you have someone friendly super smart passionate willing to kind of engage in discussion um and uh yeah so like finding people like that and just kind of like uh, just being like Hey, I'm working on this thing. Can you help me with X? I have, it's funny. So another one of my coworkers at that company still relies on that person as a mentor, even though they are at, one of them's at Amazon, one of them's at Salesforce. I can say that because I'm not naming anyone. And uh, they, uh, <laughs> you know, like my buddy still calls him up at Amazon. It's like, hey, can you, I'm not doing this thing. Am I doing something crazy right now? Because it feels very complicated, you know? And uh, I think that's, yeah, finding those people and those people kind of stay with you throughout your career. It's not company specific. You, you just have to pick them up at a specific company or yeah. as a friend. Um, yeah, yeah. By the way, and I just want to diverge here for one second, so please forgive me. Uh, when I say passionate, there's a, I, th I feel like in job recs everywhere that we read, uh, there's this like kind of toxic idea of like passion of like, if you're not working full time outside of your work on stuff, uh, like you're, you must not be passionate about this stuff. And I think some of the things you've said, like, hey, like I have a family, like Jesus, I like I I, I gotta travel, I gotta do all this stuff. Um, I I feel the same way, and I think that is not what I mean when I say passion. It just means an actual interest for yeah this stuff. It does not mean I have a second job for free afterwards. <laughs> That's what you should judge me on in the interview. Um, because I it's think one of the yeah. It's one of the things that I uh, wrote down is like, you should, you should like what you do. It's one of the things that I don't like is when I run into somebody who doesn't take any pride in their work mm -hmm. and, and the things that they're doing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be super passionate, but I really like, I have a home lab and I really like playing around with this stuff, but it, a lot of the work I do is kind of taken away from that. So there's also that level where you get too involved in something and it kind of kills that passion a little bit. Um, but I was really doing it just to get more familiar with Linux and to understand these tools so I could have a career and I could do these things. I just happened to find out I really enjoy these things. Yeah, so. yeah. I think I just, I just want to put that out there of like, 
you know, please, if you're in you know, a lot of, a lot of you watching probably are in a position now where you're interviewing people, uh, you know, please do not judge someone based on how full their like GitHub thing is. You know, if they're mm -hmm. confident, smart, a kind person in an interview, willing to learn, obviously interested in tech, uh, you'll do fine hiring them. In fact, one of the worst things that can happen is that you build a, I've worked at startups like this, you build an office that's so full of passionate people that the expectation is everyone works 24 hours a day. And, uh, you know, like that's, that's the flip side of it. Like you don't want to be there if, if you know, yeah. don't, don't select, um, <laughs> Someone said this recently. I thought it was pretty wise. Don't don't like select for heroes. Like if your team has, mm. it, it depends on heroes. Like you are screwed because at some point, you know, organizationally, you're saying oh, it's fine because we have heroes. So like we can let things get totally out of control, and uh, our ops people or or devs or whoever our tech people will save us. Uh, that's a terrible environment to be in. You end up with just like. Yeah, it's just disastrous. Legacy code and like security problems, no, yeah. like pushing the fix at the 11th hour. So uh, rely less on people that are going to, that look like they're ready to work overtime and rely more on people who, you know, are smart, kind people who are uh, interested in the work, ready to work, but also have boundaries. Like, you know, I do, I have a family, I want to go home. Uh, those people yeah. write their code because they don't want to get interrupted in the middle of the night because some shit they wrote broke. So those are the <laughs> want. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Cameron, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this. And uh, I hope, I hope, I think you said so many things that are critical for people that are new to this uh, to to know and learn. And like, you're not alone. You're not crazy. Like this is just how it is. It's very yeah. confusing at the beginning. Uh, and I hope you said so many practical things that people can use. I just, I want to say thank you uh, for sharing and being honest. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share it with the people. I hope it helps. Right on. Thanks, dude. All right. Talk to you later. Cool. Later, man.